In this video, we're going to talk about Francisella tularensis. Francisella tularensis is the causative organism of tularemia, as it's more commonly known. Um, this is a gram-negative rod, um, and it's kind of off on its own. Not that there aren't important gram-negative rods, but this organism is often talked about with other organisms that are spread by vectors, namely ticks. Um, and as far as gram-negative organisms, there aren't a lot of them that seem to be spread by ticks, or at least not as uh, not a lot of important pathogens that we talk about that are spread by ticks um, that are also gram-negative. There are, of course, the atypical bacteria and the spirochetes, um, like Lyme disease, that are really um, well-known, but this one's kind of a one-off. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not important. This is an important zoonotic pathogen. And we know it's zoonotic because in order for us to get it from a tick, it had to infect another animal. So we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into kind of the symptoms and um, areas where tularemia is more common. All right, so main characteristics. First off, this is a very, very small gram-negative cocobacillus. Um, and it's, I, I almost hesitate to ascribe it a shape name because as you can see here in this image, I, I mean it when I say very small and it's also very faintly staining. So this kind of reminds me of like that, um, like sponge painting, uh, it was kind of popular in like the late 80s, early 90s. It's just very faint um, on the image here. So it's difficult to see, but cocobacillus really means that it's pleomorphic, right? It can be spherical or rod-like um, and anywhere in between the two. It's a non-motile organism, so it doesn't have a flagella or anything like that to get around. It has a very thin lipid capsule, which is antiphagocytic, um, as all capsules are. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more and the role it plays in the immune response to Francisella. Um, it's an aerobic organism, but it can do facultative anaerobic respiration. Um, this is important because it does spend a portion of its life cycle intracellularly, particularly in macrophages and neutrophils and epithelial cells and endothelial cells that it's able to infect. This is a tricky organism from a growth perspective. It's highly, highly fastidious, um, and it has these extra growth requirements, namely cysteine. Um, it needs that in order to grow well in culture. And so we can find that in chocolate agar um, mm. or in BCYE agar. It's also very slow growing. It can take up to three days. So really, even though culture is always kind of the gold standard, um, you're going to want to be aware of kind of the travel history your patient might have and their symptoms before making a tularemia diagnosis. All right, let's talk about the pathogenesis and immunity. Um, like I said, it is an intracellular pathogen, okay? So it's going to replicate in the macrophages, neutrophils, epithelial cells, and endothelial cells. And like other intracellular pathogens like Legionella or Listeria, um, it's going to inhibit that phagosome lysosome fusion. So if we just kind of think back to our phagocyte here, right? It's gonna take in the pathogen right, into a little phagosome. So basically it pinches off around the um, organism here and then it pulls it in and it's kind of keeping it locked up tight in like a holding cell, right? And then there's going to be lysosomes that actually contain the proteases and hydrolases that are gonna break down the pathogen, right? That's where those azerophilic and specific granules are. So then these two are supposed to come together to create the phagolysosome that will actually like kill the organism in there, or at least kill 2% of the organisms that are in there. Um, many organisms, including Francisella, are able to stop that fusion, kind of um, cut us off at our knees of our best defense there. Um, and the way it does this is it secretes proteins that basically facilitate bacterial escape from the phagosome. Um, and then the organism actually, instead of being destroyed, it breaks out and it is able to then replicate itself within the cytoplasm of the cell. So the macrophage or neutrophil will kind of become full of these Francisella organisms or um, bacterium. Um, also like other intracellular pathogens, um, this means we're gonna need a really strong cell-mediated immune response, right? Because it's essentially then 
becoming an intracellular pathogen. So when I say cell-mediated immunity, the first thing I want you to think of is CD8 positive T cells, but certainly NK cells would be helpful and your Th1 CD4 helper cells. All of those are gonna be really important for helping to fight an intracellular pathogen. Um, you also want a strong innate immune response like interferon gamma and TNF alpha that's gonna kick that immune response up really high. Um, the other thing that a lot of the pathogenic strains of Francisella actually contain are um, the antiphagocytic capsule that I was talking about. So that very thin um, capsule, it's a polysaccharide rich capsule. Um, so anytime you hear that, you can think of a couple things. One, if it's a polysaccharide, that means we need either um, pattern recognition receptors to recognize it or antibodies to recognize it because T cells aren't gonna do anything. Um, two, remember that capsule is what basically makes it difficult for a phagocyte to even engulf it in the first place. So we would need some opsonins. So the capsule actually inhibits phagocytosis. This capsule actually also inhibits complement mediated killing during the bacteremia phase of disease. Um, so it has a couple tricks up its sleeve. The other thing to keep in mind, like other um, gram negative organisms, there is endotoxin or LPS in the cell wall. Um, this isn't a major pathogenic factor for the organism, but LPS is still pretty nasty anytime you have to interact with it. All right, so there are three types of tularemia. All of them are spread by ticks, okay? So this is always going to be coming to you from some bite, okay? The tick bites, uh, tick bite is kind of the most common reservoir for um, tularemia. The tick becomes infected. Then um, remember, anytime we're talking about tick bites, the salivary glands of the tick need to become infected. And then the tick kind of deposits them back in, and that leads to infection of the human. So we have three types of tularemia. There's type A west, type A east, and then type B, which occurs in the Mississippi River Valley. Type A West is basically found in your Rocky Mountain area, um, which makes sense, right? That's a place that people would go hike, hiking, which increases their availability to ticks. Um, so Rocky Mountains to Sierra Nevada Mountains. This one is actually associated with exposure to rabbits, um, hares, and actually cats. So further evidence that our household feline friends might be trying to kill us. But it's not so much that they're associated with these animals. They're associated with the ticks that like to associate with these animals. Okay, so it's kind of a friend of a friend situation. Type A East, this is actually um, kind of like Southeast, really. It's really found in Arkansas and Mississippi and Oklahoma. Um, so Central Southeast states, again, we're talking about associating with rabbits, um, hares, and cats. So, and once again, it's just the ticks that associate with them. All right, type B, like I said, Mississippi River Valley. Um, also areas of really high rainfall, um, particularly the Pacific Northwest, okay? Um, these areas are gonna have a higher likelihood of having um, Francisella. In this case though, instead of rabbits, we're talking more rodents, small rodents, um, and still cats, um, which makes sense because cats hang out with rodents, so their ticks probably hang out with each other too. Okay, we've reached the point in the video where I show you some crazy pictures. Um, so one of the hallmarks of tularemia is that it's an ulceroglandular disease. Um, ulceroglandular, it, it means exactly what those words sound like together. You have mass um, inflammation and ulceration of a gland, and in this case, lymph, lymphoid gland, okay? So this poor person here, their um, gland here on their neck is just, it's huge, okay? See all of the swelling? It looks almost like um, a small, uh, I don't know, like a, like one of those bouncy balls you get uh, from a machine, and it has been kind of grown on the side of her neck. Um, this is the most important because it's the most common form of tularemia. Um, basically, you get a 
skin lesion that starts as kind of a painful papule developing at the site of the tick bite. The papule then is going to ulcerate and have kind of a necrotic center and a raised border. Then nearby at the closest lymph node, you're going to get this mass lymphadenopathy. Um, at this point, you would also have bacteremia, so you might be able to find the organism within the blood. Um, and you're also going to have some systemic symptoms because we're bacteremic, right? So anytime there's bacteri bacteria in the blood that's detectable, that also means that it's probably going to cause systemic symptoms. So our system, systemic symptoms are going to be kind of the same as they always are. Fever, headache, fatigue, arthralgia, myalgia, all of that um, may be present. The second one is a little bit less common, kind of a lot less common, and that's oculoglandular, okay? So this is a specialized form of the disease and results from direct contamination of the eye through fingers or exposure to water or aerosols. So basically it's tularemia of the eye. Um, it causes a painful conjunctivitis. So you can see how inflamed this poor person's um, conjunctiva are. And actually the whole eye has become inflamed and red. Um, you can see this um, raised surface here. And you'll also get regional lymphadenopathy um, with that one as well. Okay, the last one is pneumonic tularemia. This results of inhalation of infectious aerosols. Um, this unfortunately has the highest morbidity. Um, it can be a very serious condition if not treated correctly. Um, so you need to recover the organism rapidly in cultures and then treat appropriately. It's really difficult to detect the organism from respiratory cultures. So you're gonna wanna go blood. Um, and additionally, um, if ulceroglandular tularemia is not appro appropriately treated, uh, patients can progress from the ulceroglandular down to the pneumonic tularemia. So in either case, whether you're dealing with ulceroglandular or pneumonic, you want to quickly isolate the organism because one can lead to the other, and pneumonic has that high morbidity and mortality that we talked about. So here's kind of the bad news. We need to isolate it from specimens and culture it quickly, right? Because we don't want ulceroglandular to become pneumonic. Um, couple of problems. One, it's really hard to detect the organism from aspirate, node, or ulcer. But if you do, um, you're going to want to culture it because as I showed earlier, this is a really small faintly staining organism. So it's very, very difficult to see on gram stain. Um, PCR are not currently, it's not currently widely available. Culture is the gold standard. Once again, you're going to want to use BCYE or chocolate, but it's going to be slow, right? We're talking three plus days, which is a long time. Um, you can do serology, but remember, serology uh, is going to take a couple days to show up. But typically, tularemia is diagnosed in most patients by finding a fourfold or greater increase in the titer of antibodies during the illness or a single titer of 1 to 160. Whichever is greater, doesn't matter. Um, the antibodies might persist for years though, so it might be difficult. You might get like a false positive and think your patient has tularemia when they actually have something else. Um, if you're going to treat it, which hopefully you will because you'll find it quickly and then treat it, you're going to want to use gentamicin or doxycycline um, or ciprofloxacin. Those are kind of your recommended options for tularemia.